We're going to continue today in our series, Disciple, and we're going to look today at the disciple as a saint. And I think that saint is a, is a word that creates all sorts of interior emotions, usually negative for us as American Christians. Uh, in fact, I would say that we are probably far more comfortable uh, with thinking of ourselves in terms of sinner than we are of thinking of ourselves as saint. Like it seems more humble to refer to yourself as an unworthy sinner. But saint is an important word for us in the New Testament, actually throughout the Bible. Uh, in its biblical meaning, a saint is any believer uh, who is in Christ and in whom Christ dwells, whether in heaven or on earth. Saint in the Old Testament was always to refer to God's people, his covenantal people, a people that he had covenantal faithfulness with, and he called them the holy ones. And their holiness was in direct correspondence to his holiness. He called them to be his special people. We find that saint used by the Apostle Paul uh, is this favorite term to refer to Christians. In Romans chapter 1, verse 7, he says, he says uh, to, all, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. This is something that we have to reckon with because it's a term that we've, we've, I think, moved away from based upon the way that the church actually has misused this word and the way that culture misuses it. Uh, we think of the way that the Catholic Church canonizes uh, individuals for great acts of godliness. Uh, and this is, tends to be the way that we define saint today, the saint being someone who is recognized as having an exceptional degree of holiness or likeness to God. But is that really what it is? What I want us to see today is that a saint is a holy one, one who is in covenant faithfulness with his holy God. A saint is not holy because of what we do, but our holiness is directly derived from our relationship with the only one who is holy. We just sang it in the words of the song, uh, The Blessed Light, in which it says, Oh Lord, I am like the moon. Without the sun, I hang in darkness too. That our holiness is secondary, if you will. It's secondary light. We reflect the character, the nature of God. And so if I was to ask you today, what is Jesus like? Would you be comfortable saying he is like me? Anyone? Anyone? I just want, I've, I so desperately want someone to stand up and be like, no, he's just like me, actually. Uh, and then I would say, follow that man uh, or that woman. Well, actually, as, as uh, heretical as that sounds, that actually is the verbiage of the Apostle Paul. He says, imitate me as I imitate Christ, that his relational, his covenantal faithfulness to his King Jesus was so deep, so rich, so full, so succinct that he was able to actually say, if you were to follow the pattern of how I live amongst the world, you would actually be following the pattern of Jesus. And I believe that that is what God wants for his church. And so today, I want us to consider what it means to be a saint, what it means to be a holy one, because when we think of holiness, we tend to think of it in terms of separateness or separation from sin. And I would say that that is a component of holiness, but God's holiness is primarily his dedication to his purposes, his plans. And in fact, his holiness actually becomes defined for us through Jesus, his actual entrance into our sin his willingness to make it his own, his willingness to be both the judge and the judged on our behalf so that we can enter into a holy covenantal relationship with him. And so what I want us to consider today is, is the saint is one who is, is dedicated to God. A saint is one who is distinct from the world. A saint is one who is empowered by the Spirit. And then we'll consider Jesus as the truly and the only holy one. And our holiness is dependent upon our abiding and remaining in him. So beginning with 
the saint as one who is dedicated to God. I want to begin with a passage from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 1 and 2, because in the New Testament, um, Peter uses the language that we are a royal priesthood. And, and it's important for us to understand the language of the Old Testament to know what he means by that. What does it mean that we are a royal priesthood? And I would say that it primarily means that we are a people that are dedicated to God, that we might be a reflection of his personhood to the world. This is what we are called to be as a community of faith. When Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount that you are the light of the world, that you are the salt of the earth, he's making declarations, not hopes. I hope you'll be the light of the world. I hope you will be the salt of the earth. No, he's saying you will be a reflection of me if indeed you are mine. So a saint is one who is dedicated to God, and that means that we are a royal priesthood. And to understand the priesthood, we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 18, and we see this incredible first two verses in chapter 18. The Levitical priest, all the tribe of Levi, shall have no portion or inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the Lord's food offerings as their inheritance. They shall have no inheritance among their brothers. The Lord is their inheritance as he promised them. Notice, the Levitical priests were not to receive a portion of the land, not any of it. Why? Because God said they will be separated from my people, distinct from them, dedicated to me in such a way that I myself will be their total portion. I am their inheritance. This is what I believe Peter is pointing us to um, as a church when he calls us a royal priesthood, that saints are a people who are dedicated to God. Our dedication, that means that our singular focus, our singular amb ambition, our central heart affection is placed upon Jesus Christ before anything else. But you see, instead of being dedicated to God, one of the great dilemmas and the problems within the church today is that we tend to be divided with our affections, that we try to maintain a portion of what the world has to offer instead of letting go, deny yourself, pick up your cross, die to the lie of who I never intended you to be, and come follow me. This is the essence of a disciple. A disciple is a saint. He is one who is holy based upon his proximity to the truly holy one. One who is dedicated. The priesthood was a holy position among the children of Israel. They were to become the conduits by which God's presence would be known to the children of Israel. Now the church has taken that role upon itself as we become new creations in Christ. We are to be a people that are totally dedicated to him. That means that there is no place for division. That means that if anyone be in Christ, all things are new. That means that we are disciples and disciples have left all to follow him in simple obedience. But dedication to God is challenging in this age in which our minds are constantly distracted, constantly drawn into all sorts of alluring realities. We live in a time where there is, there is a deeper desire to maintain some sort of, some sort of relevance in the world uh, by maintaining our devotion to the things of the world. And if we do that, then people will be drawn to what we are. No, there will be no difference. Our dedication to God is that covenantal faithfulness. It's like, it's like a marriage covenant. When I said yes to Darcy, I was saying no to every other woman for the rest of my life. When I said yes to Darcy and Darcy said yes to me, there was a new relational bond that I can experience with no one else. There was a dedication to her and her dedication to me that creates the marriage un union. The liberation that comes through that, my freedom is no longer the freedom to do whatever I want, to give myself to whoever I want, but now it's my freedom to live fully, fully for her. That's my marriage covenant. And marriage is given to us as a picture of what our covenant to Jesus is supposed to be like. That we are dedicated to him. 
And so I would just ask you, as we consider this, is the idea of what a saint is, a saint is one who is dedicated to God. Is that the supreme central focus and ambition of your heart and your mind today? Is Jesus the one that captivates your affections? Does he have your heart? Paul says, it is the love of Christ that compels me. See, we think of sainthood as the things that we do that make us morally better than other people. But the thing that sets us apart from the world is not how awesome we are. It's how giant Christ is in our life experience. It's how much he is the central passion of our lives. Does our lives reflect a dedication to him? This is what makes us first and foremost a saint. We are dedicated to him. When we talk about God as holy, we are talking about a God who is dedicated to his purposes and his plans. But we also have to take into consideration that the saint is not simply one who is dedicated to God, but the saint is one who is distinct from the world. And this is really challenging for us because we are called to recognize that God alone is our portion. It's what George MacDonald said, the one who has God has everything. Do we really believe that? All that I need, all that I could ever want for true satisfaction and purpose and hope in life is found in the person of Jesus. It's not found in this or that thing. It is actually found in the relational fullness that comes from being dedicated to my king. And that dedication to my king means that I am to be distinct from the world. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. The saint is one who is distinct from the Lord. Now, I want you to consider this, what Peter says. How does he start off? He says, therefore, preparing your minds for action. How do we actually develop a distinction? What makes us different from the world around us? Well, one of the most challenging components is again and again we are told in the scriptures that what we think matters. Now, it's true that we are what we love, but what we think about often defines what we love or betrays what we love even. And so what we're told by Peter is to prepare our minds for action. And it's not, it's, not, it's not lazy thinking, it is focused thinking that is to actually move us into activity that brings about a distinction between us and the world that we're trying to reach. And he says, in being sober-minded, that means that our mind is to be clear. And what is it to be clearly set upon? It is to be set upon your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you in the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, that the saint is one who is dedicated to God and distinct from the world because they have put their central focus, their, their deepest interest into the person of Jesus. They have fixed their eyes on Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And then it says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. The one who fixes their eyes on Christ, who as a disciple, is die, deny themselves and pick up their cross and is following him is one who has to keep him ever before our mind. We have to look to Jesus. And this means that we're not going back to our old life. The children of Israel, when they began to grumble against God as he was leading them through the wilderness, they didn't understand what he was doing and they began to distrust him and they began to long for their old life. Said, if only we could go back to Egypt, back to slavery, because at least there we had meat to eat. And I think that that becomes an incredible picture of the temptation within the Christian life and the, the natural uh, temptation to, to refuse distinction 
We don't want to follow Christ, so we start looking back to the world. And one of the challenges with the church today is I think the church has lost its authority and its power in the world because instead of being distinct from the world, we think that the best way to reach the lost is to actually meet it, meet it in its own ground, meet it according to its own terms. Actually, let, let, us, let us figure out a way to present the gospel in a way that does not offend modern sensibilities. And usually what that means is that you eradicate discussions about the need for repentance, the realities of sin. It's usually met with a desire to, to, to somehow ape the entertainment of the world. Listen, the world will always do the world better. That is not what we are called to to be like as Christians. I don't know about you, but when I came to Christ, the last thing I needed was church to be cool. I just needed someone to save me. What drew me to the faith was not the pastor's ability to bring forth a relevant message that met me in my, in my despairing wannabe rock star reality. What he gave me was a direct gospel that preached the love of Christ in spite of my broken sinfulness, and he called me to repentance. The music was horrible, (laughs) but nonetheless, Jesus was still good and on the throne. What do we need to be? What I noticed was a people who were different, a people that had something markedly different. Darcy, one of her testimonies is, and she she was starting at this path toward Jesus a couple years after me. And one of the things that drew her to the authenticity of the faith is she met a group of Christian women um, who, uh, who just reflected something to her that she knew was lacking in her own life. There was, there was light, there was salt. She saw something that she wanted. And I think that this is important for us to ask, are we functioning like saints? Does the world look at what you have Does the world look at what we have as a community and say, they have something that I desperately need? And that is a hard question to answer, is it not? But it shouldn't be. This is why Peter says, he doesn't say, don't do this thing, don't do that thing, don't do this thing. He just says, prepare your minds for action, be sober-minded, and set your hope fully on Jesus. Nothing is more challenging than keeping Christ ever before your thoughts. Devotion to God means that everything you do, do it unto the Lord. Distinction from the world means that everything that you do unto the Lord actually sets you apart from the world in which you live, which actually makes Christ known to the world around you. This is why our witness is directly connected to our conduct. How we live and how we love should actually back up what we speak. And I think that this is incredibly important because here you have the the call, be holy in all your conduct, be dedicated to God, be distinct from the world. All of it is relational in its connection. He says, Leviticus 11, 44, for I am the Lord your God, consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. What is he calling the people of Israel to do? To set themselves apart. He wasn't telling them to clean up your act. He was saying, be ready for covenantal relationship with me. Present yourself before me. Sin, in its essence, is a refusal to be related to God because we want to be our own God. He called the children of Israel just as he calls us today to set ourselves apart for him. We are dedicated to him. We are distinct from the world. Listen to 2 Corinthians 6.14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness. Now, this is one of those verses that is often used to uh, discourage uh, Christians from dating non-Christians. And though that may be a component, I would say that it's more of, an, it's more of an, a, a call for us to actually look at our relationships and look at who, we, who it is that we're spending the majority of our time with because we are defined by our relationships. And we need to understand the power of relationships that are not built upon Christ. This also speaks to the absolute importance of having Christian community that actually saints are always plural, that you can't be a saint by yourself, that being a saint is being a part of Christ's church, being 
holy ones together as a community. And I think that this is one of the realities that I have seen it again and again. Or I've seen Christians that are not allowing the distinction to actually bring about a reflection of Christ and instead do get wrapped up in ungodly relationships. And it's not long before that unravels their faith altogether. And I don't know how many times I have to see that as a pastor to confirm that that's just seem, simply seems to be the way it works. And we need to understand that, that we become like whoever we spend the most time with. And that is important for us to understand. So notice that I haven't said anything about a saint being set apart from sin. Because I think a better way of framing that is to state it this way, that the saint is one who is empowered by the Spirit. Because if I said the saint is one who sins less, <laughs> that's a very much establishes once again that, that our sainthood is dependent upon how well we do A, B, C, D, and E. And it gets us away into, into dangerous territory, um, into the, the possibility. I think it's the, the two extremes is that you either become a legalist or a libertine. And I'm going to live however I want because I'm saved by grace, or I'm going to work really hard and I'm going to abuse. I'm going to. I'm either going to abuse grace or or misunderstand it. But the call is found here in Galatians chapter five, verses sixteen through twenty-one. This gives us a picture of a saint as one who is empowered by the Spirit. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. Notice here he's saying that there seems to be some sort of civil war within us where we're told that to become born again, we actually die with Christ. The old man, the old woman literally perishes with Christ and we are resurrected into newness of life. And that newness of life, what makes us holy is not our works, but it's God's Holy Spirit actually put within us. And the, the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives is dependent upon the yieldedness of the believer. And so listen to what he says here. He says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. It's not about the things that you do. It's about the one who's in control, essentially. And he says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Now here's the list. This is the reality. This is what, what, um, what defines sin. He gives us a, this, uh, this huge list. He says, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, which is where we get the Greek word uh, pharmakia, which, is, uh, which speaks of drugs, actually. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. It's my favorite line. <laughs> and things like these, saying that there is an ever-abundant list that he doesn't even mention here. Now, he says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know about you, but that is troublesome. Because you may read it, you're like, oh, well, I'm not, I'm married, I'm happily married, I'm not sexually immoral. Okay, great, whatever, mark that one off. But mo probably many of you are incredibly sexually immoral. Impurity, yeah, I don't even know what that one means. Let's, let's, okay, let's skip that one then. Sen <laughs> sensuality, uh, I, I'm, what is that? Okay, <laughs> idolatry, oh, dang it. That's anything that I place upon the, the throne of my heart as a central affection. So that, that can even be, dang it, that's idolatry can even be the good things. That can be my kids. That can be my wife. That can be my husband. That could be my church. That could be my ministry. All these profound gifts from God that have been exalted to the place of God now puts me in the list of those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. Calvin said that the heart is a human idol factory, that you pull up one idol and it just reveals another one. Can't escape it. Dang it. Sorcery. A lot of bummed out wizards in here right now. <laughs> the guy in the cape in the back is breaking his wand. <laughs> or 
Or let's just translate that as drug use. I've had many people wanting to, uh, actually that word is directly connected with, with drug use, which is interesting because most of pagan idolatry and worship was driven by the use of drugs to enter into that ecstatic spiritual place. And the history of many of the drugs that are, are promoted in our society today as healthy and beneficial have a long history of being utilized to enter into domains that we're not even intended to be open to. But hey, we don't, fine, you, you don't buy that? Let's take enmity. Let's take strife. I had you at idolatry. What about jealousy? I've met with many people feel, they watch people's lives unfold on Instagram and they feel bummed or left out, they're hurt, they're jealous of what their friends have and what they don't have. We, we, we all struggle with that at times. I'm jealous of my son because he's really handsome and I'm getting old. It's my birthday this week. I turned 44. It's like legitimately halfway through my life. Uh, fits of anger. I, I threw a tantrum about that. Yeah, the other day, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, things like these. I warn you. You see, when we look at the list, what we find is that we're not free from it. And honestly, if we were to really consider it, we're not free from much of it. Then the old man, the old woman is always waiting for an opportunity to resurrect his or her head. This is why we are told in Romans chapter 12, verse one, that I beseech you, brothers, by the mercy of God, that you present yourselves as living sacrifices. The reason that I bring that verse up again and again and again and again with you is because I have come to the conclusion that the only thing that a Christian actually has the power to do is to surrender. And it's not a passive surrender where you just give up. It's an active surrender in which you give up control and follow fervently King Jesus. It's the gospel that makes us holy, guys. It's the gospel that makes us saints. Paul is very purposeful in laying out the work of the flesh and the work of the spirit because he knows that it is easy for the flesh to, to overcome the power of the spirit because the spirit, there is a liberation, there is a freedom. It's not the freedom to do what we want, but it's the freedom to give Christ the right to be Christ in and through us. This is faith. This is what it means to be a disciple, and this is why the disciple must be a saint. We need to quit living like defeated sinners, merging into the world around us to the point where we make no difference and no one can tell a difference. Christ wants us to rise up and claim the victory that is already ours. We're not working toward it, we're working from it. This is the key to understanding holiness. This is the key to understanding what it means to be a saint. Notice what he says. Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh because the Spirit is what? What is he called? It's not a trick question. He's holy. Your holiness is a dependent holiness, a dependent holiness upon the one who actually is holy within you. Christ says, I will put my Spirit within you and make you new. You have supernatural resources. So this is one of the great problems of what we do. We make justification Jesus's part and sanctification our part. But both justification, that is God declaring the sinner righteous because of Christ's sacrifice on our behalf, we somehow separate that. Well, then sanctification, then he just leaves us to our own devices and we have to work really hard to, to earn the favor that's already ours. No, both sanctification and justification are achieved by Christ and we experience the fullness of those realities as we abide in him. That is, as we remain with him, as we sober-mindedly fix our attention upon Jesus. Darcy and I were talking the other day and she just had this morning, she got up and just 
immediately got into the word and just her devotions were so she just even after the kids went to school she just kept spending time with christ and it's amazing it, you can just tell the difference i can see it in my wife and she can see it in me and we can see it in our friends when we've spent much time with jesus one of my favorite lines in the entire bible is in the book of acts when it, um when john and peter are being uh, uh, harassed by the, the by the religious leaders in jerusalem for healing a man, and it says as they took, they arrested him, and it says it was obvious to them that they had been with Jesus. That's what I want the world to say about us. We are a people that are called to be dedicated to God, a people that are called to be distinct from the world, and a people that are called to be empowered by the Spirit. I don't have to say set apart from sin because to be empowered by the Spirit is to not be under sin's rule but it is actually to accept the full victory over sin through the work of Jesus. And this is why we must understand that the holiness of grace is the grace of holiness. I want to explain to you what I mean by that, by reading you this powerful, powerful quote on the chapter Saint um, in Dietrich, at the close of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, The Cost of Discipleship. He says, It is necessary for the sinner to be parted from his sin and still live before God. Don't think I'm saying that God is okay with sin. He hates sin because sin robs him of what he loves, which is people. But so closely is his life identified with sin, that is you and I, that the only way in which that, that can be achieved is by dying. That is to say, the only way for God to maintain his righteousness is by putting the sinner to death. The problem is, how can the sinner live and be holy before God? And the problem is solved by God himself becoming man, taking upon himself our flesh in his son, Jesus Christ, and in his body bearing our flesh to the death of the cross. In other words, by putting his own son, the bearer of our flesh to death, he puts to death all flesh on earth. What are we speaking of when we speak of grace? We are thinking of the freedom in which God turns toward us in love and forgiveness through Jesus. But when we speak of holiness, are we not speaking of that same freedom? For is not God's holiness his self-humiliation, his perfection entering into broken humanity and putting it to death once and for all? He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus did not sin, but he actually became sin. We can't even get our heads around that mystery. Our holiness is hinged upon he who alone is the holy man. Our holy humanity is wrapped up in the, in the man God, Jesus Christ. We need to understand that the gospel declares to us, if you want to be holy, it's not by you trying to sin less. No bad habit goes by focusing on the bad habit especially the bad habit of sin, because sin is wrapped up in so much of what you are as a human being, one who by nature is rebellious against the God who loves. But surrender to the gospel makes us saints. And now we have victory. Does the, does the saint no longer sin? No, it says that whoever says he's without sin makes God a liar in First John. But the saint is one who continually reckons the old man, the old woman dead and lives by the power of the resurrection life that's available to us in Jesus. And so how do we function as saints? Do we achieve sainthood by doing a series of tasks to make us better? We achieve sainthood by resting in the, in the holy Christ. In fact, Jesus says, if you're in me, you are a saint. And if we would actually begin to believe that and appropriate that in our lives, we would live with a lot more victory and a lot less defeat. He wants us to be set free. Why do we walk in bondage like slaves? Are you more humble for thinking yourself a sinner more than a saint? It actually takes humility to reckon the position that you have in Christ. Because let me read you this verse, Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is, no, ne- there is no male and female, for you all are one in Christ Jesus. 
as we abide in him, we are saints. Jesus loves you. He wants you to have victory over your brokenness. He died and accomplished total and absolute sanctification for a lost world. He offers himself to you. He says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all people unto myself. His salvation includes his sanctification. And as we surrender ourselves daily to him and come under the influence of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit continually directs our minds and our hearts toward Christ. And the more we follow him, the more we yield to him, the more we will reflect him and we will not be afraid to say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Amen? Let's pray.